Good morning. The subcommittee will come to order. Without objection, the chair is authorized to, to declare a recess at any time. Uh, I ask unanimous consent the members not on the subcommittee be permitted to sit with the subcommittee at today's hearing and ask questions. Um, is there any objection? That objection is so ordered. I want to welcome everyone to our hearing today, Building 21st Century Infrastructure for America, Water Resource Projects and Policies, Part 2. Uh, the Corps of Engineers constructs water resource projects uh, across the nation and even military missions around the world. Uh, these include navigation projects, ecosystem restoration, flood control, hurricane protection, and other water resources uh, type projects. Uh, today we're going to review six Army Corps of Engineer Chief's reports and three post authorization change reports that have been delivered to Congress since we passed H.R. 8 out of committee and uh, out of the House of Representatives. Uh, this brings the total number of Chief's reports to 12 and the total number of uh, Packers, the post authorization change reports, to four uh, since the last word of bill. Uh, these reports are the result of an arduous process where they uh, look at technical feasibility, environmental. Uh, implications and economic considerations as well to ensure that there is a public or national interest in proceeding with these projects. All the reports are tailored to meet locally developed needs um, and uh, have support from the non-federal sponsors. This hearing today is an important step in Congress's oversight responsibility for the Corps' water resources program, and I appreciate Major General Spellman uh, being here today. I believe it's the first time you've been in our committee. And I do appreciate all the members that are here as well. I recognize the ranking member and Ms. Napolitano for any remarks that she may have. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, very pleased to be here this morning to welcome Mr. Uh, Spellman. Uh, and uh, thank you for holding this very important hearing to reflect on the condition of our nation's water resources infrastructure. And I do want to uh, extend a warm welcome to today's witness, Major General Scott Spellman, Deputy Commanding General for Civil and Emergency Operations at the Corps of Engineers. Today's hearing is a crucial and necessary step that, is, uh, that this subcommittee must take as we work towards enactment of the Water Resources Development Act of 2018, the WERDA. Since the passage of the Water Resources Development Act of 2016, last Congress, the Corps of Engineers has completed and submitted 16 chief reports to Congress include projects in Seattle, Washington, Norfolk, Virginia, uh, Lower San Joaquin River in California, Kentucky River in Kentucky, San Juan, Puerto Rico, and mm -hmm. others. These projects, whose purpose include for flood and storm risk management, ecosystem restoration and navigation, are critical to developing and maintaining our economy at the local, regional, and national levels. Today, subcommittee members have the opportunity to evaluate these chief's reports, as well as the 2017-2018 annual report submitted by the Corps to Congress pursuant to Section 7001 of the Water Resources Development Act of 2014. These annual reports identify complete, completed and proposed feasibility studies, as well as proposed modifications to authorized projects or studies based upon requests submitted to the Corps by non-federal project sponsors. Mr. Chairman, like you, I'm excited to continue our work on the Water Resources Development Act of 2018. This committee has been extremely successful in getting our work done, thanks to you and the ranking, uh, as, uh, you and uh, the uh, uh, ranking member of the full committee, as well as the chair, and authorizing this next generation of core projects will benefit our communities and our nation. Unfortunately, I share the frustration of many of our local sponsors and my own colleagues in this body when we account for how little work the work they put into authorizing core projects ultimately means if the funding to build that project does not follow easily. That is to say, our nation's water resource infrastructure is vastly underfunded, and what we need is a bold vision on how to make necessary infrastructure investments. Ultimately, only increased investment in our water resources infrastructure will enable us to see that the hard work of our local sponsors and the court comes into reality. I thank you, Mr. Chair, for holding this hearing. Look forward to the dialogue. Yield back. Thank you, Mr. Napolitano. 
Uh, before I begin introducing our witness this morning, allow me to dispense with some unanimous consent request. I ask unanimous consent that the record remain open 15, uh, 15 days for additional comments and information submitted by members of the witness to be included in the record of today's hearing without objection so ordered. I ask unanimous consent that the record of today's hearing remain open at such time as our witness has provided answers to any questions that may be submitted to them to him in writing without objection so ordered. Uh, thank you. I want to welcome Major General uh, Scott Spellman to our committee, the uh, Deputy Commanding General of the Corps of Engineers, and uh, General, um, recognize you for uh, your testimony. Well, thank you, and, and good morning, everyone. Chairman Graves, Ranking Member Napolitano, and distinguished members of the subcommittee. My name is Major General Scott Spellman. I'm the Deputy Commanding General for Civil and Emergency Operations for the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. I want to first thank you for the opportunity uh, to be here today to discuss Chief's reports that have been completed since the passage of H.R. 8, the Water Resources Development Act of 2018, back in June. As this is my uh, first time testifying before this subcommittee, I did want to take just a brief moment and introduce myself. Before assuming my current position, I served as the Corps Commander, Army Corps Commander for the Northwestern Division. In this role, I had the privilege of overseeing a very challenging and dynamic annual program of more than $3 billion for civil works, environmental restoration, and military construction projects. My area of responsibility covered 14 states, from St. Louis, Missouri to Seattle, Washington, essentially encompassing the Missouri and Columbia River basins. I'm excited to take on this challenging role leading the Corps Civil Works Program and look forward, to, look forward to working collaboratively with this committee as we deliver beneficial water resources projects to our nation. Now, since the passage of H.R. 8, six studies have been completed and have had chief's reports signed. All of these are still under review by the executive branch. Four of these chief's reports recommend navigation improvements, including those in Seattle Harbor, Washington, Norfolk Harbor, Virginia, San Juan Harbor in Puerto Rico, and on the Three Rivers Project along the McClellan Kerr Arkansas River Navigation System. A fifth is a recommended project for flood risk management on the Lower San Joaquin River in California, and the sixth is an aquatic ecosystem restoration study of the Rosacas, which are Oxbow Lakes located in Brownsville, Texas. The Corps has also approved and transmitted three post-authorization change reports for executive review. Two of these reports document and recommend an increase in the total authorized project costs which require congressional authorization. One is for the construction of the Chickamauga Lock and Dam in Tennessee, and the other is for construction of a new lock at the Sioux Locks on the St. Mary's River in Michigan. The third post-authorization change report recommends crediting of costs to the non-federal sponsor associated with certain activities on the central and southern Florida project, Kissimmee River restoration. I would also like to take this opportunity to provide a brief, up, brief update on the 2018 report to Congress on future water resources development as required by Section 7001 of the Water Resources Reform and Development Act of 2014. An open period for potential non-federal sponsors to submit projects occurred between April and August of this year. During this 120-day window, the Corps, Corps utilized traditional media as well as social media outlets to inform the public of the opportunity to submit proposals. Additionally, we hosted a public webinar uh, to explain the criteria that these proposals must meet. A total of 34 proposals were received and they are currently being evaluated per the criteria in Section 7001. Uh, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee, this concludes my statement. I appreciate the opportunity to testify today and I look forward to any questions you may have. General, thank you. We're first going to go to the gentleman from Arkansas, Mr. Crawford. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, good morning, General Spellman. I want to thank you for being here today. And first, I want to express my uh, gratitude uh, for the uh, recent chief report on the Three Rivers Project in Arkansas. It's a critical project to keep navigation on the Arkansas River active and robust. In the northern part of my district, I've had constituents tell me they believe there have been uh, more major flooding events in the last few years, uh, generally speaking, than historically has been the case. Um, they've been told that the Corps and perhaps others in Missouri have been actively cleaning out some of the rivers and tributaries in southeast Missouri. This could obviously result in more water getting into my district much faster. We haven't had the same kind of dredging in northeast Arkansas, and so flooding has been a problem there more frequently. I wonder if you can comment on any of this and give me some clarity as to what may or may not be going on with regard to that situation. Sir, I'm, I'm not familiar with the, the situation as you have uh, described it, but I would, uh, as, I, as I, I've been in my job for the, um, about uh, 90 days now, I welcome the opportunity to come out to your region and work with our, our regional commanders and our district commanders uh, to get more detail, and I welcome the opportunity for my staff to follow up with yours on a more complete answer. 
Outstanding. That would be very helpful. We have a problem in our state where uh, we don't do a comprehensive approach and somebody does something upstream and it affects someone downstream. And I'm just thinking maybe we could harmonize with our neighbors to the north and uh, in a, more of a comprehensive approach. And I certainly would welcome you to the district to view that. Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Go back. I recognize Ms. Napolitano. This uh, subcommittee has uh, passed the award of 2014-16 and they were enacted into law. And it speaks to the members of Congress uh, desire to respond to the war resources needs of our communities, but also to the demand in, to, for increased investment. Uh, can you please describe this for the subcommittee the scope of the Chief's reports and post authorization change reports that the Corps expects to send to Congress this coming months? So, may if I understand the question, you would, you would ask. You're asking me to just briefly describe each of the, uh, the chief's reports? Not each one, but uh, what, what is the scope of them? What, what is more important? What has been salient in the submissions to you? Um, so, ma'am, uh, let me tackle it this way. So, as I mentioned, three of the, uh, the chief's reports deal with uh, navigation. These are essentially deepening of diff diff different segments of the project, as I mentioned, in Norfolk, San Juan, and uh, in, in Seattle Harbor. We have uh, an ecosystem uh, restoration project in, um, of, as I mentioned, of the Rosacas in, in Brownsville, uh, Texas. Um, and, and, and this, these are the chief, as you know, they go under concurrent review, both by, uh, by Congress and the, uh, the administration. Uh, okay, that, um I'm, I'm interested in more detail on one of them, but that I'll ask for it later. Okay. Um, uh, in the, uh, uh, the significant, uh, significant amount of time this year uh, to evaluate the federal government's response to the hurricanes, Irma, Maria, and Harvey, of course, Puerto Rico stands out, and the U.S. Virgin Islands, where people lost their lives, and uh, it took 11 months to restore power to the entirety of the island. Uh, can you provide an update of the course activities in Puerto Rico and Virgin Islands related to the 2017 hurricane? And additionally, uh, the hurricane season has left us largely unscathed as far as far. I believe it is imperative that we apply the lessons learned from, from those hurricanes for prepare for future storms. That at end, can you please describe activities the Corps has undertaken or plans to undertake to better prepare our nation for future hurricanes this, this coming season? Yes, ma'am. I would start out by saying that uh, any loss of life is tragic and that our, uh, our hearts and our thoughts are with those families that suffered the loss of loved ones in the, uh, in the storms of last year. Ma'am, I would refer you to the uh, GAO report that, uh, that came out. Uh, I saw it for the first time yesterday. It came out uh, this month that uh, effectively describes the conditions that the Corps and our other FEMA partners were operating in. First of all, we had concurrent and overlapping storms. Harvey, Irma, and Maria were disaster number 25, 26, and 27 of but 30. But what about the preparations? Yeah, yes, ma'am. So we, uh, we go through a very detailed AAR process uh, and, and capture lessons learned from our performance uh, last year in disaster response. We do AARs, after action reviews, at the district level, the regional level, and at the headquarters level. I would tell you the, the, the actions that we have taken uh, already this year include prepositioning of people well in advance of the storm. So hurricane, for example, Hurricane Lane here a couple of weeks ago that approached the main island of Hawaii. We set in advance long before uh, that, um, that storm was scheduled to make landfall, our roofing teams with an advance party of our contractor. We run a model, we can predict uh, what communities were going to have trouble, and we had people on the ground before landfall looking and getting assessments and inventorying of our stocks uh, to ensure that we could uh, respond in a more rapid fashion. All right. Um, that's good to hear, but uh, I'm still worried that we are not prepared enough for um, in rebuilding to withstand future hard hurricanes. Right. So um, I, I would thank you, um, um, Madam, as well as all of Congress for the very generous appropriation in the Harvey Irma Maria Storm Supplemental. Uh, Congress. Uh, gave us $17.4 billion, um, and ma'am, that is going to fund 235 projects 
in 33 states to add resilience uh, to our, our communities. Uh, we are taking this very, very seriously. We know we have to deliver for the nation. In fact, we have uh, uh, a lot of our senior staff meeting in, in Dallas, Texas this week as we outline that program because we want to get these projects in the ground as soon as possible. Thank you very much, sir. Yield back. Thank you. We're going to go to Mr. Gibbs from Ohio. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Chairman, for being here. On the SULOC, um, we've got the economic uh, validation study, the executive summary here. Uh, this came in June, I believe, of this year. I, I, my understanding that the full report hasn't been released because of security sensitive redactations. What's the status on getting the full report to the committee? So, so sir, we, we received the report from our Mississippi Valley Division and, and General Kaiser, and that report is undergoing review in, in my office. Uh, we're going through that in, in a, a fine tooth comb um, before we afford that on. Okay. Um, also, uh, you have to refresh my memory. I, I think in your, in your testimony, you talked about the, um, the, the one lock there at Sioux, the St. Mary, yeah, Sioux lock. Yeah, what, what's, what's the status? Because I'm looking here on this executive thing on the co benefit cost ratio. I remember in the past, we've had discussion about OMBs and the cores and, and wh where we stand on all this, on, the, on this uh, benefit cost ratio to move this project forward. Yes, sir. So um, the, uh, the analysis that uh, our team has done uh, developed a, a benefit cost ratio of about 2.42, if my memory uh, yeah. serves me yeah. correctly. I think uh, some of the, um, the differences that we have with the, uh, with the local sponsor is how we calculated that uh, economic uh, benefit. And so I'm happy to go into detail, either here or, or separately, uh, on, on the details of that difference and how we'll continue to gauge and, and work through that. Okay. But so you anticipate this moving forward? I've been a, I've been a big advocate that SULOC needs to get done. So your anticipation that we're on, on the right track to? Yes, sir. Okay. That's yes, sir. Confirm. Okay. Thank you. I yield back. <laughs> General from California, Mr. Garamendi. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, General, thank you very much for uh, all the work that you're doing, and uh, congratulations and condolences on your new job. Um, you're going to have your hands full. Uh, you've been very, very helpful to me in the uh, Sutter Basin issue. Uh, I think I was, I don't suppose you'd been in your job too long before I had the opportunity to talk to you about it. Uh, and you've been very creative, and I very much appreciate that. We're down to the last uh, wire of this, and uh, if you could uh, turn your attention to an integrated, vertically integrated process, I think we can get this thing done uh, for the next flood season and complete a 40-mile project in the Sutter Basin. And so really appreciate your effort on that. Um, so we'll move that along, and it's, it's been a very good process in which the Corps, working with the local entities, uh, has been able to successfully move in a very rapid way. Also, the Marysville project, uh, two very important projects in our area. And so uh, my appreciation and thanks to you and to uh, the district as well as uh, headquarters here. Um, the 204 authority fits right into this, and so here we go. Maybe next time we can write legislation with more clarity and not run into the problem that we've had here. I guess that's our problem. Um, and th this is really addressed to uh, Mr. Uh, Graves and uh, to the chairman and uh, ranking member of the committee. Uh, Word is in process. Uh, the uh, conference committee is moving along. I'd like to draw the attention of the committee and certainly to the conferees to the uh, necessity of maintaining Section 310 of the House bill. I don't know. The Senate sometimes is a bit difficult to deal with, but Section 310 authorizes the Three Rivers Levy Improvement Authority, uh, and that's the last three miles of the project on the Yuba River, uh, at no cost to the federal government. It's simply the authority to get that project done. And finally, I know this is going to be an issue all of us are going to deal with, so we may as well get it on the table, and that is, uh, should the Corps of Engineers continue as it is today, or should it be reorganized? Uh, my own personal experience, having dealt with the reorganization in 2010 of the, um, uh, in the Department of Interior, where the uh, mine safety programs were dispersed from the Department of Interior and sent to multiple places. It created a decade of chaos. 
And so I would suggest that we stay with where we are and not deal with any uh, further uh, effort to dismantle the Corps of Engineers. Uh, so I'm taking the opportunity to express a position, some of which is uh, of interest to the members of this committee and beyond. Uh, with that, I think I've just about consumed two of, or three of my five minutes. So uh, let it go at that. Again, General, thank you very much for your work on the uh, Sutter Basin Project. Appreciate it. Appreciate your uh, willingness to um, be creative and find a way past some legislative glitches that unfortunately we created for ourselves. So thank, thank you, sir. I look forward to working with you. Uh, I want to thank the gentleman from California. And just very quickly, Section 310 of the House bill pertains to Yuba River. Uh, that is a project that we have been discussing with the Senate together with our, um, our counterparts. And uh, it, we have been working to defend the House bill, which we think has very good policy, uh, which would include Section 310, but we will follow up with you directly as we continue discussions with the Senate. But, but I will say that we are united um, with uh, Mr. Napolitano in, in pushing uh, the House bill, which would include Section 310. Uh, th there's no doubt uh, in my uh, support for your position, which we all created here, and the hard work that you're doing. I didn't mean to indicate anything otherwise, uh, but to put this on the record that um, this is important, uh, as is the bill that we put out, which was, in my estimation, perfect. Well, I, I, I want to thank the gentleman from California for his contributions to the bill, and, and uh, we will continue to work with you. Uh, Mr. Palatano and I have, have both advocated for the inclusion of that project in the final version, and, and we will continue to work together to, to push the Senate on that. So thank you. Uh, we're going to the gentleman from California, uh, Mr. Denham. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. General, good morning. It's good to see you this morning. Uh, glad to see the Chief's report uh, for Phase 1 of the Lower San Joaquin River uh, is uh, now signed. Um, and included in the, uh, in the WARDA bill. This is a, a great cost-benefit ratio. But more importantly uh, than the cost-benefit, this is also the area where the Corps is going to build their first VA uh, mega clinic. And so while we've got uh, 262 critical infrastructure sites in that area, uh, 12 which are considered uh, essential to life and safety, we also have Sharp Army Depot, and now we're going to build a VA hospital. So uh, my question to you is, uh, um, as we're looking at, again, appreciate the fact that we signed phase one. It's taken way too long. We've been working on this for, for quite some time, but because we're building the new, the new mega clinic and now we've got phase one in the works, it is time to get quickly onto phase two. And uh, I want to see the uh, core request funding from Congress so that we can do our job here and expedite this as well. So my first question is, uh, is the Corps ready to uh, request funding on phase two of this project? So, sir, my, my understanding uh, is that uh, phase two is obviously not uh, included in the scope uh, of the current effort by the non-federal sponsor. We would ask that uh, the non-federal sponsor uh, give us their uh, desire to move forward with phase two, and then we could take the next, uh, next step, sir. Uh, thank you, and uh, I look forward to having the Corps come back out again and, and uh, have this discussion at the local level. I think it's critical to understand specifically what's happening on the ground. But from a national perspective, one thing that is very different here versus any other project in the country is this is the Corps' first big project where they're going to build a mega clinic for the VA. So I, I do think that there is some uniqueness in, in this. But one of the other challenges that we have with uh, with moving forward is uh, the Executive Order 11988. Um, can you commit to me that the, uh, the Corps will quickly address and resolve the, that Executive Order issue, uh, the question surrounding the RD-17 area, and move forward with the second phase of this feasibility study? Um, I, I know that our locals have to do a request, but we have an issue with the Executive Order that we've got to resolve as well. Uh, yeah, yes, sir. You have our commitment. Uh, once we receive the request from the non-federal sponsor, we'll take the next necessary next steps. Thank you, General. I yield back. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Denham. We're going to go to the other gentleman from California. We've got a triple here, uh, Mr. Lowenthal. Thank you. And before I begin, I'd like to preface my remarks by agreeing with uh, Representative Garamendi and complimenting the chair of the subcommittee and the ranking member for working together on the WERDA project. I think this is a model for the way the legislature should work, and I'm proud to be part of this committee, subcommittee 
and to state to state that. Will the gentleman yield for? Yes. I just want to make note, this bill, this is a major infrastructure bill. This passed the House of Representatives by a vote of 408, and there were only two confused people. So, <laughs> yield back. I am glad to say on this occasion I was not one of those two confused people. <laughs> not saying that on other occasions I haven't been confused. Uh, General Spellman, uh, first I want to thank you for the Corps' important work on the Chief's reports that was submitted to Congress this year. I also uh, congratulate you also on, on, the, on this assignment. Uh, you know, as I am the co-chair of the uh, Congressional Ports Caucus, uh, and I applaud the efforts uh, to complete reports on the critical navigational improvements in both Seattle and in Norfolk. That will, that will increase the flow of, of commerce at these ports, and I strongly support that, and I strongly support the Corps' work. But closer to home, I know that the Port of Long Beach is working with its LA district on a, na on a navigational improvement study, but they have requested a waiver to allow the study to exceed some limits of the three by three by three smart planning process. The waiver will make sure that the channel deepening study moves forward in tandem with the port's master plan. That's the reason that they're asking, to make sure that the master plan and the three by three moves. I'd appreciate just your full consideration uh, of this request. Sir, thank you. Um, we, uh, we fully understand and recognize that not every project, not every study neatly fits within the, the confines of three by three by three. Um, we go through a process to evaluate what we'll get from the district, and then I, uh, I meet with uh, Assistant Secretary James every week, and we talk through these, uh, these requests as they, as they come in. Thank you, and as one of the non-confused members of Congress, I yield back. <clears throat> The gentleman from Texas, Mr. Babbins. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, General, welcome. Thank you for being here. I um, also want to thank you for visiting my district and my region uh, recently. And uh, I appreciate your service, too. I noticed a Purple Heart ribbon on your chest there. Well, thank you. I don't, I don't know the details of that, but appreciate your service. Uh, one year ago today, my district and most of uh, southeast and coastal Texas was still reeling from the devastating effects of Hurricane Harvey. And I wanted you to please share uh, briefly some of the specific lessons that the Corps has learned from our experience with this terrible storm and how you have applied those findings to improve your practices and protocols uh, for your response to the inevitable next storm, if you don't mind, just briefly. Appreciate that. Uh, yes, sir. Um, the, uh, certainly uh, 60 inches of rainfall uh, over the, uh, the city of Houston and the surrounding areas was, was unprecedented. Um, so, yes, sir, we have uh, done an early set of after action reviews, as I mentioned, uh, both our Galveston district, our southwestern division, and also at the region. I think one of the key takeaways uh, that we have shared uh, amongst the, uh, the command is, is the importance of, um, of communication. Uh, with partners above and below the, uh, the projects. Uh, we, um, we, we believe the district and the division went through means to, to talk to uh, everyone affected, potentially affected um, by this unprecedented rainfall, but the perception exists that we did not. Uh, and so we've got to double back on our efforts and look at our processes uh, for, for storms of this nature when they, when they occur. Great. Okay, thank you. And then the second thing, uh, I was, I'm aware of various procurement practices at the state and local levels that are really artificial barriers to competition for new and innovative materials on projects. And that's why I introduced uh, a bill, H.R. 5310, the Municipal Infrastructure Savings and Transparency Act, uh, to ensure open competition and competitive bidding and in infrastructure projects that receive federal funding. And that will help lower costs and provide greater choice of new and innovative materials for engineers. And I was hoping uh, that the Corps might uh, help me, uh, commit to helping me to identify some of these state and local barriers and work with me on recommendations to eliminate them so that we can save taxpayer money. Uh, I want to ask you, what are the specific programs that the Army Corps already has in place to spur innovation and infrastructure investments and technologies? 
and any comments you might have there. Sir, just, just a couple. Um, so we recognize that uh, with this record level of appropriation and storm supplemental that we've been trusted with that uh, our, our standard project management process are, are not going to allow us to deliver uh, on time for the nation. One of the areas we know we want to, we've got to get better at is innovation, both in our, our acquisition strategies, in our designs, and certainly in the materials that we use. So we have a, a set of labs, as you know, sir, throughout the core. Uh, and we've really tasked them, they, they, they've got to be able to help us. And we want to work with industry, we want to work with private partners as, as, such as the ones that you're mentioning, sir, so we can get better in this regard. And you do have our full commitment. The, I appreciate that. So how does the core ensure the competition and contracts uh, to maximize uh, taxpayer savings and help with investing in more projects? Uh, how, would you, how would you, what are some of the things that you already do? Yeah, yes, sir. So uh, obviously we, we, are, uh, we are bound by the federal acquisition regulations and all of our, our acquisition processes. Having said that, uh, some of the things that we want to take on to allow us to speed the delivery of project is not have 43 districts each going after separate acquisition strategies for the 253 right. supplemental projects I mentioned earlier. We want to get into uh, things we call multiple ward task order contracts. We can do them at the, at the regional level. We're even discussing doing them at the enterprise level, sir, to, again, to expedite the ability to get uh, moving dirt, as Assistant Secretary James would uh, describe it. Absolutely. We want the latest technologies to be utilized to save taxpayer money, so we sure hope so. And that's all I have for, I'll uh, yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Thank you, General. Gentleman from Texas, Mr. Weber. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. General Spellman, welcome. Glad to see you here. I've got five ports in my district, three coastal counties of Texas, starting at that other foreign country, Louisiana. We were ground zero for Harvey flooding. We've got more ports than any other member of Congress. Uh, port of Beaumont, Port of Port Arthur, Port of Texas City, Port of Galveston, and the Port of Freeport. Sabine Natchez uh, waterway is the longest waterway in the Gulf Coast, second only to the Mississippi River. They have a, we have a chief's report, I believe from 2014, word on deepening the Sabine Natchez waterway. And you may be aware that the Port of Beaumont moves more military personnel and equipment than any other port in the country. So I would argue that national security is extremely important. It showed in bad from Hurricane Harvey, all the rain from Hurricane Harvey, which as you know, was more of a rain event for that part of the Texas Gulf Coast than a, than a wind event. Um, there's a lot of lightering having to go on uh, because of the fact that it's shoaled in. Uh, the channel needs to be deepened. We have an approved chief's report, and I didn't see it in the PDF today that you offered uh, at the end of your comments, the updated 2018 PDF. Why is that? Sir, if, if you're referring to the uh, Sabine Pass, Galveston Bay? No, no. Uh, unless that's including the, I, I read it very briefly. I know that there's a coastal storm barrier protection study going on uh, because as Congressman Babin said, not a question of if we get another hurricane, but simply when. Um, and a lot of jet fuel and energy is produced on that part of the Texas Gulf Coast and his and my district combined. So it's extremely important that we don't have a release out in the Galveston Bay if, if something destroys some of the tanks holding oil or other noxious chemicals. But also the fact that we want to get the Sabine Nature's Navigation District, uh, waterway rather, dredged down to close to 50 feet. I don't see that anywhere in your remarks here today. Uh, no, sir. That, uh, the, the, the pass that um, the Sabine, uh, the Sabine um, Pass Galveston Bay was funded as new construction in the storm supplemental total of... Uh, Right. Well, that, that's actually something separate. There is a chief's report from Word of 2014 on the deepening of the Sabine Natchez waterway. And I looked at your, there's 77 pages in the PDF at the end where it says chief reports updated 2018. And I see that one that you're talking about, which is the study being funded. But I do not see the chief's report for the Sabine Natchez waterway. What, can you shed some light no, on sir, that? Sir, I'll, I'll follow up with you. I'll go back and, and take that, and we'll follow up with your, with your staff. Oh, oh, yeah, let, let's find that out. I also see the one there for Galveston Channel Extension. Um, there is also, a, there is a chief's report, thankfully, uh, on the Galveston Channel Extension, and also the one Sabine passed to Galveston Bay that you cited. But please follow up on that, because that's very, very important to our area. We will, sir. Um, and you've been there 90 days, is that what you said? About 90 days, yes, About sir. 90 days. Um, You'll find out that the BCR on the Sabine Natchez waterway is, 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 uh, is, some might say it's a little lower 
then they'd like to see it, and obviously we would. All of the development, there's billions of dollars of development along that long waterway. It has the most developable area. And the fact that it's so instrumental in national security, I don't know how we figure that in. How do we get that BCR up? Because it is strategic to our country's defense. A married fleet is out there. We've got some mothballed ships out there, if you want to call them that. So please check into that, because that's extremely important. The Galveston Extension, Galveston Channel Extension Project also is important to us. Um, and so if you could check on those and get back to our office would be greatly appreciated. Sir, I will. And I had a great visit down to that region here uh, a couple of, of weeks ago. And you mentioned Beaumont. I'm certainly familiar with the importance of Beaumont from deploying out of Fort Hood a number of times. But right. Sir, thank you. Well, please come back. We've got good fried shrimp and good seafood gumbo. We'd love to show you around and show you how important it is. Just please get back to us. Thank you. Yes, I yield sir. back. Thank you. Uh, we're going to go to the gentleman from Florida, Mr. Mast. Thank you, Chairman. I appreciate it. Thank you, General, for taking the time today. Appreciate you speaking with me before this. I appreciate all your work uh, and the, the Corps' work on WERDA 2018, um, the work with the Southern Reservoir, the EA Reservoir there, uh, the work in uh, working to help us get uh, uh, an update to the Lake Okeechobee regulation schedule, the Kissimmee River restoration, all of it. Really appreciate the, uh, the partnership on that. All of these things that you've worked with my office on, they surround uh, what's known as management of Lake Okeechobee. I know you're very familiar with this. And I wanted to ask some questions about Chief's report specifically, a little bit on that process. Are, chiefs, are, are old Chief's reports ever updated? Sir, um, as, as we get closer to uh, appropriation on a, on a uh, say, a, a dated uh, chief report, they may have to go through a limited reevaluation. Uh, economics may need to be uh, updated. There may be design uh, changes or new materials, uh, new technology that may be incorporated. But th there can be uh, a requirement to update the report, sir, before uh, we move forward with construction. But being dated, that's something that you would say, we look at this and we can say this is dated, it should be. It should be updated. That's common practice, or yes, sir. Within the line, the parameters of being reasonable. Yes, sir. Um, the chief's report for the development of the the Central and South Florida project that that governs all of this. That's a chief's report from 1948. Would you say that there might be room to update a chief's report from 1948? It's what specifically provides that the priorities are flood control, water supply for uh, municipal, industrial, and agricultural uses, prevention of saltwater intrusion, water supply for Everglades National Park, and protection of fish and wildlife, is, but it's from 1948. Yes, sir. So I, I'm not familiar with the uh, the 1948 Central and South Florida project. I am more familiar with some of the more re recent efforts under the uh, the Central Everglades Restoration Program and the 68 projects associated with it uh, to get after some of the uh, the water supply and, uh, and water quality issues in uh, in your region. Thank, and I'm glad you brought up water quality issues. It, it matters to me to hear you say that. It's important to my community to hear you mention water quality um, because sometimes that is often left out. These other issues that I just mentioned are important, but to me, when we're talking about these chief's reports, it is an issue that the chief's report mentions very specifically the things that will be managed, and it doesn't mention anything about the water quality, which in many cases is a state issue, um, but you did mention it is an issue in, the, in what's going on with central and southern Florida uh, policies. Uh, so in that, I would ask, are you aware of some of the water quality issues? One of our most recent tests, which is in line with other tests, is said that the, uh, the sample was 495 parts per billion of microcystin algae, a toxin. That's what's being discharged out of the lake into an epicenter of human population. That's an issue of water quality. And so I would ask, do you think that the 1948 Chief's Report could be updated, it could be looked at as dated, and there's potential to put something in place that mentions health and human safety as, as being a factor? All right, yes sir. So I, certainly there's, there's always room for, for updating. I, I would just, I wanna be clear, the, uh, we, we don't have the authority to regulate water quality. Um, the state's responsibilities uh, for water quality in your region are very clear in the, uh, the Clean Water Act, and as you mentioned, the Central and South Florida um, authorities. Um, but sir, no, this is a partnership uh, going down the Central Everglades Restoration Program. We want to do our part uh, with the state and all of our partners uh, to, help those, uh, to help those communities. Well, 
in that, in talking about the balance between state and federal uh, relationship there, the Army Corps feasibility study from 1999 on this issue, it reads, uh, water quality improvement must be an integral part of all hydrologic restoration. It also reads, several plan components and other project elements are included to improve water quality conditions. It also reads, Water Resources Development Act of 2000, which established uh, the Central Everglades Restoration Project in public law. It lists protection of water quality as a specific authorization. So water quality is the intent of Congress. I just listed off three specific places. It's clear that water quality is the intent of Congress. Uh, and so it's in that that I would like to ask you, can you work with me on addressing the fact that uh, this issue, this, this human health and safety issue that is related to water quality is not listed in this chief's report? Can your, can your office, can the Corps work with me on making that a piece of a chief's report when managing this system? Yeah, yes, sir. I, I would welcome this dialogue with you and your team. Thank you. I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Mass, the Vice Chairman of the Subcommittee. We're going to go to the gentleman from California, Mr. Lamalfa. You got another Californian, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Um, uh, as we know, farming, agriculture is a major economic activity in the U.S., totaling $100 billion in exports every year. Um, and Army Corps and EPA have been making it very difficult to responsibly use land when they regulate the Clean Water Act the way they have, especially in my district in California. Uh, they've been unfairly attacking farmers and legitimate land users by retroactively claiming that ag land is a wetland or that norm normal farming practices exempt under the Clean Water Act suddenly require permits, you know, otherwise known as previously, previously converted cropland. Should someone decide to go along and pursue that permit, it might take three years for them to get it off their desk, three crop years lost for them to move this permit that they're already exempt from having under previous converted cropland, et cetera. So what I'm asking you, sir, is will the Army Corps and EPA work with the other land management agencies to make their jurisdictional determinations so that land users have some idea where to direct their issues when somebody someone suddenly decides a permit is needed. Uh, sir, yes. So what uh, we program we started here just in the last uh, 90 days in the core is we're taking a, a deep dive, a hard look at every longstanding permit. I have some permit uh, applicants that have been outstanding for, for five years. Uh, we're doing a, a detailed look at a, every one of those and why those permit actions have been uh, suspended. There's a, a variety of reasons. But you, yes, sir, you have our commitment to move on these decisions in a much more uh, rapid fashion. Okay, okay. You, you promised to move more quickly on the permits, but what about the concept that the permit wasn't needed to begin with under exemptions clearly spelled out in the Clean Water Act and reinterpretations done by some divisions of the Corps that have seemed to gone on gone off on their own tangent? Yeah, sir, I, I am not familiar with the details, but you do have our commitment that we will we'll, we'll look into this. I appreciate that. Check it out in Northern California via Sacramento, the Reading office, and a lot of action happening in Tehama County. Um, for example, disking. You're familiar with disking in agriculture? It's, uh, no, sir. No, no sir. sir. Okay. Well, I'll explain it to you. It's uh, similar to plowing, only a disk is, a, is an implement towed behind a tractor that has uh, approximately 40, maybe 50 round discs on it that rotate as you're pulling it through the field. It turns the soil slightly and, you know, reincorporates. Disking is used by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service for wetland management. It's used for mosquito abatement to prevent more breeding of mosquitoes, protection from evasive plant species, used to recycle nutrients in the soil to keep the land productivity high, and is used by almost every agency and organization that has something to do with land use for a variety of reasons but only to very slightly, if, all, if at all, alter the land. So what we have is agencies using this as a tool that they need, and I'm glad they do, but the Corps and EPA have attempted to say disking is an activity that requires a permit by a farmer because it creates slight mounds and therefore changes the topography. What we heard in a couple of these cases is that when you've uh, gone out and dissed a field that because it creates these mounds, 
that they're looking at this as a, uh, as a high land and a low land that is now regulatable by the, some of the people in, in, in the division here. So do you believe that really should be a standard of the Army Corps? Sir, I, I am not familiar. I have not run across this particular issue set before, and I would like, I would like the opportunity to get back with my staff and, and get some additional detail of decisions uh, or procedures that are being made in the field in, in this regard. We'd certainly be happy to help you supply you that information, too. Please, please get back to us. So uh, are you familiar with the Duarte Nursery Settlement that no, happened in California? No, sir. Okay. Well, they, they finally gave up and settled for over a million dollars on after having uh, tilled their land, after it had been idle for several years, um, thinking that with the idea that when land is idle, you know, farmers tend to fallow their land, that now that requires a permit, and that they had somehow disturbed a wetlands or a waterway of the United States. So um, do you think uh, the Army Corps is going to extend that decision to more and more retroactive activity by other farmers around the country? Sir, I don't, I don't know the answer to your question. I, 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 we will get back with, you, with your Please. staff and with you on this, uh, on this issue. Okay, thank you, because this has really been an out of control situation and not with the intent of the law, the intent of Congress, right. and I certainly think at some point your organization, so um, I, I would really ask you to look into, especially the, the Sacramento Division and what their activity has been in Northern California. We will, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. LaMalfa. I want to make note that that is a problem in Louisiana as well, and I've also heard from other members about it, General. Uh, we're going to go to the gentleman from Connecticut, Ms. Esty. Thank you very much. Uh, so, General Spellman, I had two points I wanted to raise with you, and again, thank you for appearing before us today. I understand that the Corps is proud of efforts it's made to publicize when deadlines are, but I have to tell you, in my district, there are a number of organizations that learned that have been looking to and working with my office to try to figure out um, whether it's appropriate for to request a grant. They did not realize how early the deadlines are. So I would respectfully urge that more be done, that efforts be done with every member of Congress so that we can help get them out to our communities, nonprofits, councils of government, counties, um, because it, those of us on the committee even have communities that we're not aware of this, or entities within our communities. So I think we can do a better job, and I'm just telling you anecdotally, and I've been on this committee for almost six years now, and on this subcommittee for six years, and we had organizations and uh, nonprofits and things that had no idea when the deadlines are. And they're early, if you look at in, in line of, they're pretty early deadlines, and people have a sense of when other deadlines are, and since they are as early as they are, I think we can do a better job. And I'm sure that's in the Corps' interest, and just wanted to give you that yes, feedback and see how we can help on that. The second was, again, on coordination and sort of some of the non-traditional uses. I'm going to use an example. In, in my district, we have um, a dam in Thomaston. The community is looking all up over the northeast to do greenways as part of connecting communities uh, to be able to do bikeways, walkways, reclaim our rivers. Um, et cetera. Well, a lot of that in a state like mine in Connecticut, we have a lot of dams. We have a lot of water in Connecticut, quite unlike my colleague, Mr. LaMalfa. We have different issues. We have too much water and the risk of, wa of aging dams. We're having a little bit of trouble with getting proposals like that considered. So I would ask that to recognize that depending on the part of the country, um, it would be helpful to local communities to consider a little more flexibility for community involvement and appropriate usage. Um, and we've met and we've got folks meeting soon with the Corps again to talk about this. I've already met with them regionally, but I think um, that will help the public understand that the Corps is there to serve our purposes. Um, but that also includes when appropriate constructive use of areas. And so we have several that are things like greenways in addition to your traditional flooding areas, so we will have 5th District of Connecticut will be back with proposals from the Naugatuck uh, Valley Council of Governments, from New Britain, Connecticut, which has some dam work and some dredging that are looking for help with permits. And again, we've worked on continuing authorities projects. I do want to let you know we are eager to see more funding there, um, cutting that red tape, 
which we're working on raising those limits so that we can get more of those projects again in conjunction with our communities getting these projects moving um, and we've got a lot of aging dams in my part of the my part of the world There's not enough money to go around and we're going to have to be more creative um, and collaborative to make sure these projects get done in a way that works to the benefit of communities as well as protecting the public. So again, I want to thank you. We've had a good relationship with the Corps during my time on the committee, but, but we can always do better. Yes, ma'am. And uh, thank you for sharing both of those with me, and we'll follow up with our, our, our district and our, our regional on both of, these, uh, both of these topics. Thank you. Thank you, and I yield back. Mr. Mitchell. Uh, thank you, Chairman Graves, for for allowing me the opportunity to testify in this hearing or speak at this hearing. And thank you, uh, Major General Spellman, for coming today. Also, thank you for your service to the nation and your continued service in the Corps of Engineers. Um, I also appreciate the efforts of your staff uh, before you came even, that they've met with me a couple of times to look at the economic analysis to talk about the importance of Sioux Locks. As we talked about when we started, uh, I have a fair amount of water around me in the Great Lakes, not as much as some of my colleagues here, but important water. Uh, this hearing is an example of Congress and the administration working together to make significant infrastructure improvements for this nation. As the chairman notes, uh, only two wayward members didn't quite understand the importance of the Water Resources Development Act, and that's quite a feat around here. We're here to talk about your updated reports, and one in particular is interesting to me, the Sulax. Uh, the Sulax is a critical source of infrastructure in this nation. 1985, Congress authorized a new lock, a 1,200-foot lock, because we only have one, the pole lock, right now, as your, as your study notes. Nearly all domestic iron ore goes through that lock because it, it accommodates 1,000-foot freighters. It's a national security concern. It's an economic concern, which we talked at length with your staff. And again, my appreciation to them for sitting down with the extended time they did and talking about the economic assumptions that were going in that report. While this is my first term in Congress and my first term, obviously, on the committee, since day one, the Sioux Locks were something that were important in Michigan and this country. This is the first time it's been discussed on the 115th Congress. Also, it was discussed, as you are aware, I think, at the House Armed Services Committee that I sit on and became a component of the uh, report for the NDAA this year. I was also pleased that the President decided to speak up and say that we needed to deal with the Sioux Locks, that we could no longer ignore the fact that if the pole lock goes down, 11 million people lose their jobs in 90 days. We can't move iron ore, never mind other trade. So I appreciate all your work, I appreciate the study you've done, and we'll work with you in the Army Corps and with other members to ensure that we secure the funding we need to go to the next step, which is some of the detailed studies you need to do for engineering, so we can build that lock that uh, we promised this nation in the mid-1980s we do, and we'll finally move forward. Please be aware, I tell your staff, if they need any assistance, any feedback that in Congress, I certainly hope to stick around and we'll do anything I can to support the efforts for the Sioux Locks uh, to continue the development of that additional lock. Uh, any feedback you have on that issue, Mr. General Spellman, I appreciate it. Sir, first of all, I, I want to thank you. Um, I've, I've been to the Sioux Locks uh, in, in, in previous assignments, a number of, of occasions, so we, we do understand the importance, as does uh, the Chief, our Assistant Secretary, and frankly, all of the Army understand the importance of that uh, waterway uh, to the uh, the nation, we we want to do this, and we we want to we want to do this work. We we thank Congress for the uh, the funding to do the major rehabilitation on the existing lock, and uh, we look forward to uh, getting the funds and the appropriation uh, to to construct the uh, the new lock. So we'd love love to continue the conversation and dialogue with you and your staff on the economics study that we've done. I know there's some disagreement, uh, but I don't think there's any disagreement on the importance of this uh, of this piece of infrastructure to the to the nation. Well, there may be some differences on the details in the economic study. Uh, as I'll use a term, close enough for government work, and now let's get on with uh, with actually doing the work. Next time you decide to go to the Sulax or your staff, uh, have my let my staff know. I'll wander up there. It'd be nice if we didn't do that in the dead of winter, but uh, <laughs> happy to go to the Sioux Locks with you and, uh, and talk further about the importance of that, not just for our state but for the, and the Great Lakes, but for the, and this nation. Uh, building that lock is critical. Yes, sir. Thank you very much. Thanks. I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Gentleman from Georgia, Mr. Woodall. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. 
Thank you for being uh, here today. Thank you for your partnership uh, on all the projects you're working on uh, down in Georgia. Of course, we're particularly proud of what's going on in, in Savannah. It was a long time uh, coming, and you all uh, never gave up on making that uh, happen. And, and uh, we're about to have real economic uh, results for the entire southeastern United States, and I, I thank you for that. Uh, what I really want to talk about, uh, though, uh, in terms of 21st century policy uh, is return flows. Uh, I represent a community uh, in, in Georgia, uh, county of Gwinnett, uh, they spent a billion dollars on a water treatment plant uh, to uh, pump the water back in uh, to uh, Lake Lanier, our, our core uh, lake, uh, uh, cleaner uh, than we took it out. In fact, we sit on the Continental Divide. If you uh, uh, dump your, your uh, cup of water out on one side of the county, it uh, runs into the, uh, into the uh, Gulf. And if you dump your cup of water out on the other side of the county, it runs into the Atlantic. And knowing that that Gulf uh, Basin, that uh, Chattahoochee River uh, water system is so uh, uh, threatened uh, with, uh, uh, with uh, overutilization or, uh, or undersupply, uh, we make an effort to put as much as we can back into that uh, basin. And yet, as we talk about uh, water allocations, uh, we get absolutely no credit uh, for a billion-dollar water treatment plant that's uh, doing it better uh, and uh, taking more stewardship responsibility than any other community uh, in the basin. If we are to encourage uh, jurisdictions to take those risks, to make those investments that are going to benefit us all uh, as, a, as a community, as a region, as a, as a nation, We've got to get some credit. Uh, it has got to be skin in the game for making bad decisions and skin in the game for making good decisions. Could you speak to that just a little bit? Uh, no, sir, I, I, I agree with you. Thanks, thanks you for, the, for those comments. I'm, I've got much to learn about Lake Lanier and this particular uh, basin and, and, and the project that, uh, uh, the recycling project, it sounds, that you, that you mentioned. I, I would love the opportunity to get down there and, uh, and walk the ground with, uh, with your staff and the constituents and then come back to you on the, uh, the math of the reallocation that, uh, that you mentioned. I appreciate, uh, I appreciate that. I, 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 I know folks want to be good stewards, and I'm proud to represent a community that puts its money where its, where its mouth is, but just like good tax policy encourages people to make different decisions, good water policy is going to encourage more good stewardship in the basin. Uh, I also want to make sure I, I told you we, uh, we often uh, have forums uh, to, uh, to poke the core for things that uh, didn't go the way we wanted them to go, and I get those telephone calls from constituents. Uh, in fact, I have uh, uh, several uh, families with wheelchair-bound family members uh, who live on Lake Lanier. And of course, if you want to uh, get from your house uh, to your dock, uh, you've got to roll over core property uh, to get there. And core has uh, some real rules about how you can uh, develop uh, that property. And these families were unable uh, to put together a, a pathway that their family members could use to get from the house uh, to the dock. I mentioned that uh, to our local core leadership. Uh, and they said, not on my watch uh, is that going uh, to be true. These, these rules are in place to protect communities. These rules are in place to empower uh, communities. And uh, these rules are not in place to stifle families who are just trying to, uh, to do uh, the very best they can with the, with the hand they've been uh, dealt. Uh, and uh, you all uh, stepped in, made the necessary uh, uh, waivers and, and, uh, and allocations such that those family members are now utilizing uh, their facilities and, and uh, those families feel included uh, in, our, uh, uh, in, in our entire uh, regulatory process. Uh, it could have been a, a multi-year headache. It could have been one of those things that, uh, that we argued about uh, for a decade, but instead it was one of those things that that uh, your men and women on the ground took responsibility for, said we can do better uh, and we will do better and, and we wish this had never happened to these families uh, to begin with. And I just, I would just want to thank you for giving the teams on the ground the kind of flexibility to make those things happen. Th thanks, sir. I'm very familiar with this issue from my time. It's very similar uh, cases on, in the Missouri River, on the Columbia River and all the tributaries. I, I understand and uh, thank you for the comment. Yeah. The, and uh, one, uh, one final uh, accolade, uh, we did have uh, theft start to tick up, and one of the regulations that we had in terms of trying to keep docks uh, uh, up to code was that security cameras were prohibited uh, on docks, as were couches and old washing or dryers and, and things that you would want to be prohibited from the dock. But security cameras made that, uh, uh, that list. Uh, you all partnered with us last summer uh, to change that uh, uh, regulation. It's made a real difference in terms of, uh, of homeowners and their, and their security and their, their watercraft. 
the security. So again, uh, things that uh, once upon a time, uh, uh, four, five, six years ago, would have just been like pulling teeth uh, to get done, uh, you all are making uh, making possible. And I'm, I'm grateful to you for, for really changing the, the, the partnership spirit uh, that those men and women uh, with whom you work every day on Lake Lanier are feeling. Thank you for Thanks, that. Thanks, sir. Thank you. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Woodall. I uh, recognize myself. Uh, General, Home and Navigation Canal is a 203 that has been submitted to, uh, to the Corps of Engineers. Uh, candidly, uh, myself and Congressman Scalise are a bit frustrated that we're not talking about that today. Could you give us an update on the status of that 203? Uh, yes, sir, I can. Um, it is under uh, executive branch review. I believe specifically um, it is with the uh, Office of Management budget, sir. It went uh, over, the off, over to the office in, in early August. And I, I believe they have upwards of, of 60 days to, to conduct a review. But that's where the... Uh, and and that, how long did it take the Corps to, to review this? Uh, sir, I, I, I can get you that answer. I, I don't know. Actually, I think I have it already. But um, uh, I just I want to reiterate the urgency of that project. It would be incredibly unfortunate to miss the window uh, that, that we have on this bill right now to, to authorize construction of that project. And, and General, I just want to make note as a sort of thematic concern, this project dates back to 1998, as I recall. Um, and uh, the project, uh, according to the Corps of Engineers' own schedule, uh, was supposed to be completed, a chief's report, report was supposed to be completed, um, let's see, even on your revised schedule, which was crazy because I, I think it, I think it came back and suggested 2008, which a project that was authorized or study authorized in 1998. I think the revised schedule by the Corps of Engineers uh, showed completion by the Corps in 2008, so 10 years to look at simply a deepening project. Um, then when the Corps continued spinning the wheels, the locals ended up converting it to a 203, uh, which is where we are now. So I just I just want to again reiterate the urgency there. Uh, General, uh, next question, uh, General Seminite has ordered the Corps of Engineers to move forward on a reorganization plan. You're familiar with the House bill that does direct uh, the GAO to conduct a study looking at uh, perhaps a different home agency for the Corps of Engineers. Uh, the President's reorganization plan, which I, I support this component of it, also looks at, at reorganizing a portion of the Corps within Department of Interior and a portion within Department of Transportation. While I'm not willing to endorse those agencies at this point, um, I do believe that there's some compatibility issues with the Corps being in Department of Defense. Uh, when I call Secretary Mattis and talk to him about Russia and China and North Korea and Syria and Iran, I don't think I should also add a wetlands permit. It's not compatible. Um, could you give us an update on, on where, where the Corps is with that? Yes, sir. So we've had the, uh, the opportunity to, uh, to brief uh, both uh, General Seminite, Secretary James, and uh, Dr. Esper. Uh, we walked them through sort of what we actually call the early stages of a mission analysis. What are the uh, limitations and constraints? Uh, what are some of the legislation that would uh, have to be changed in order to um, implement this particular uh, proposal? Um, what I shared with, uh, with all three, uh, including uh, Dr. Esper, uh, after walking him through the six major bodies of legislation that would have to be changed, uh, the first one is, is you just mentioned. Um, we, we do not think it would be wise to separate water management responsibilities on any basin between two federal agencies. The eight project purposes in many cases that Congress uh, asks us to achieve with the water above and below our projects, those decisions ought to remain in one agency. The second uh, concern that uh, we outlined to our leadership was the loss of the Civil Works workforce and the impact to the Department of Defense. So, sir, you know there are 22,000, roughly 900 Civil Works employees in, in the Corps, and they do much more than just uh, Civil Works. So today you have uh, Civil Works employees renovating uh, and modernizing the Mosul Dam in Iraq on behalf of the Department of State and CENTCOM. We have uh, Civil Works employees in Afghanistan working on the Northeast and Southeast power system, again, in support of the, uh, the combatant commander there. Uh, you're familiar that uh, we sent Civil Works employees to Puerto Rico uh, to restore the power grid when the, uh, the nation called. So it's a, uh, 
what uh, the guidance that came out of uh, Secretary Mass's staff was as we do this planning, is there a way that we retain that capability either internally or have an expeditionary capability in the, uh, the other agencies? So I, to answer your question, sir, we're on the very early stages of outlining uh, all of this uh, to, our, to our leadership and we have uh, more work to do. I would say it's the same people, the same staff that's trying to deliver on this uh, record uh, supplemental and program that Congress has trusted us with that would be doing this, uh, this particular planning. General, thank you. Um, uh, just want to quickly note a couple of other things. One, uh, I do want to thank you and, and thank your team uh, for the allocation of supplemental funds. We do plan on having a hearing. I know there are a number of members from Texas and Florida, uh, as well as, as myself, members from Louisiana and other states that are very interested in the implementation plan, want to ensure uh, a proper oversight, want to discuss with you the potential for where 1043 authority may apply to ensure expedited implementation of those projects. Uh, also would like to talk to you a little bit about some of the, the problems we had with uh, permits, uh, particularly the shellfish caucus issues in, in your former area of operation out west. And lastly, um, we are going to submit some questions to you on the record uh, pertaining to some of the projects that uh, that are that are being authorized, or excuse me, we're having oversight over today. Uh, in particular, the, the lower uh, San Quentin, we're talking about potentially $42 million a mile um, uh, for, for that project, much of which is existing levies. Um, I have questions about Seattle Harbor. You're talking about $65 a cubic yard of material. I understand it's a locally preferred plan. Just want to make sure we understand those components. That is an extraordinary cost. I would like cost on cost per cubic yard for the Norfolk Harbor. Um, uh, San Juan Harbor, I know this is a really important project for recovery. Thinking about $350 million to be borne by the island of Puerto Rico right now when we all know their financial situation. Uh, in addition to the authorization of this project, I think we need to have a discussion about a financial plan. I think that should include, obviously, my, my friend, Ms. Napolitano, but also uh, Congresswoman Gonzalez needs to be part of this. We need to be discussing how to implement this. This is part of their recovery, uh, and, and uh, we need to make sure that we don't just authorize it, but we actually have a feasible financial plan of how to move forward. Um, uh, lastly, on the Sioux locks, I, I just, uh, looking at this, you're, you're increasing your contingency to 37 percent, 37 percent contingency on this project. Um, General, I built tens of billions of dollars in projects in this space over my life. 37% um, is a high cost. This project dates back decades. Um, you also are showing a 700% variance in your uh, BC ratio. Um, uh, those numbers, you're, you're asking us to authorize a nearly a billion dollar project. Uh, that's an awful lot of wiggle room. You've got to give us some confidence that you know what you're doing and that this is going to be a good investment for taxpayers. So I would like to, to learn a little bit more about that one. But uh, with that, I'm over time. And um, any other questions that uh, folks have? Uh, gentlewoman from California. Thank you, Mr. Chair. No, I'll submit the, my questions for the record. I do have some. You good? All right. So, uh, General, I, I, again, I want to thank you very much for, for being here today. Um, I know this was your, your first time, and I know you haven't uh, been in that job very long, so I, I do appreciate you getting up to speed on, on all of these issues that are important to, uh, uh, to, the, to the subcommittee and, and to the full, full committee. Um, if there are no further questions, I, I want to thank you for, for being here today, and uh, this has been informative and, and, and helpful. Um, this is going to be probably one of our, one of our final. There, there should be a few others, but I do want to make note, and I'm sure there are going to be other opportunities in closing, that, uh, uh, that our full committee chairman, Mr. Schuster, is, is retiring from the Congress. Um, it has been an incredible pleasure to work with him. He has been able to uh, get us on a track for a two-year word of cycle. Uh, he has been a very fair, bipartisan chairman. Uh, I remember when I first came to the Congress and I told him of my interest to, uh, to join the committee, uh, I think he got right up in my face in a very intimidating manner and said, are you going to do what I say? And I uh, 
um, very sheepishly said, when you're right. Um, <laughs> and uh, he, he really has been a, a great uh, chairman to work with and, and really been very fair on policy. I think we're going to see incredible, incredible reforms, and I'm very excited to see implementation of this legislation, of FAA legislation, disaster recovery, of course, the FAST Act, and, and many other uh, bills that are going to be an important part of his legacy, but most importantly, affect the lives of, uh, of every American. Um, so he's going to have an important legacy and I do appreciate the opportunity to work with him. If no other members, no other members have anything else to add, uh, then the committee stands adjourned.